When it comes to wind power, the UK actually is a success story. And if you look at the fantastic MyGrid GB website, you can actually see that the 40% of coal power that we used to use back in 2012 is almost entirely gone from the system now. And the biggest beneficiary has been wind. But what about wind power in a domestic setting in a street like this? Would it work aesthetically? And actually, are you gonna generate enough energy to justify its installation? We have our reservations, but what if you could part own a wind farm? We're going to talk to the pioneers at Ripple Energy about that very idea. Can you tell us more about you know, why wind power is such a great resource? So wind is just fantastic. Obviously, it's the lowest CO2 source of electricity in the world um, and particularly in the UK we are blessed with this fantastic wind resource we've got one of the windiest we're one of the windiest countries in the world um, the cost is has come down fantastically so even for offshore wind which is like the newer element of, of, of the wind um, industry costs have come down by 70% in the last seven years so it's now wow. offshore wind is becoming the cheapest source of electricity as well onshore wind is pretty much already there so yeah wind is really cheap it's really green we've got loads of resource it's also really well matched in terms of you know, it tends to be windier in the winter that's generally when people need electricity more it's less windy in the summer um, so it fits quite well obviously it goes up and down every day um, but it generally fits quite well with when we need electricity as well so in one area I think the UK is genuinely world leading is how we've changed the energy market, how it's become more competitive and some great companies out there, uh, great business models as well. And we're super excited about Ripple. So can you tell us a bit more about what you're doing? Yeah, so, so what Ripple does is we enable people to own a tiny part of a large scale wind farm and have the green low cost electricity that it generates supplied to their homes via the grid by our utility partner. So we're not a supplier ourselves, we um, make it all happen for our customers. Um, we launched our first project last year and it's due to start operating in December this year. So from December, our customers will be supplied by their very own wind farm that will then get them a discount on their electricity bill because they are owning what is the, now the UK's cheapest source of electricity. So we're also gearing up to launch a second, much bigger project in the autumn um, that won't start operating until sort of probably early 2023. But okay. yeah, our model is just, we just do project after project after project um, and get more and more um, consumer owned renewables in the grid in the UK, starting in the UK, and then we want to expand um, abroad as well. So how much wind capacity have we got in, in the UK and, and, and how long could we keep deploying it for? How much more could we, could we get? So at the moment, um, last year, about 22% of the UK's electricity came from wind. Um, we expect to go up to around two thirds by 2030, which is just huge. Yeah. Um, a lot of that new um, capacity will be offshore and offshore turbines are just getting massive. So, so the very first um, offshore turbines in the UK were installed in 2000. They were two megawatt machines. Um, the ones that are planned for the North Sea now are 15 megawatt and a single rotation of one of those turbines can power a UK home for two days. So they are just massive machines. Um, and yeah, there's the UK has got plenty of room, both in the North Sea, Irish Sea and, and, and in the channel as well. We've got fantastic wind resource and we will definitely be maximising it. So it's, it's hard to kind of understate how big a shift that is. But people are obviously going to ask about heating as well. Can wind contribute to that? And obviously with that, people are going to say, well, you know, in the depths of winter, how much can wind contribute to kind of heating? So wind tends to generate more in the winter. So you get really you know much higher levels of, of output in the winter so it works really well um, in terms of complementing um, electric heating. If you had a house that was had an electric heat pump had an electric car and was all the lights and everything else was powered by um, uh, a wind farm as well that would reduce around two-thirds of the whole lifestyle emissions of that whole house, household so you're then you're looking at sort of flights and diet being the main two um, other sources so 
yeah, zero energy, is it zero carbon energy homes um, are very much within our reach now. So in five years time or 10 years time, we, we see the world being quite different, uh, a fully charged world, if you like, homes being very different. Maybe they've got an electric vehicle parked outside. Maybe they've got a heat pump, other technologies as well. How can Ripple kind of help enable that, that change? What we're looking to do is to get zero carbon energy homes, which is heat pump and an EV, as well as all the lighting and, and um, everything else, all powered by a home's own share of a wind farm. And you're then, yeah, zero carbon home, very, very um, simple, very cheap, and making a, as much impact as that home can possibly make. Um, and we just facilitate all of that for, for the customers. Great. Well, we're going to, this is us officially inviting ourselves to when you open your first uh, wind turbine. I'm sure it'll be the first of very many. Yeah, Thanks, fantastic. Sarah. Let's talk about solar electricity as opposed to solar thermal, which we'll cover in the next episode. Even in the UK, it can work and it can work well. We're not synonymous with sunshine here in the UK, but there are around a million homes with solar PV or photovoltaics on their roof. So we thought it would be a good time to look at the pros and cons of rooftop mounted solar and integrated solar. If you drive around the UK, you won't have to wait long to see roof mounted solar panels. Installation of solar PV surged in the UK with the advent of the feed-in tariff. While the subsidies have dissipated, for now at least, solar still makes a lot of sense. And if you're not keen on the aesthetics of the panels that are mounted on your roof, there's now an attractive range of integrated solar panels and roof tiles. And now we're going to talk to someone who installs renewables day in, day out. Leah, your energy, your way, oh, it's a good name. It's Thank fairly you. obvious what you do, it does what it says on the tin, but can you tell us a bit more about your business? We call ourselves a whole house renewables company. Um, what we like to do is to give people as objective advice as we can about the best tech that will suit their home. So, um, so we can choose between uh, air source and ground source heat pumps, solar PV, solar thermal, uh, we do EV chargers, batteries, um, yeah, I think that's the list. I think there's something like a million households with solar PV on the roof. And obviously that's great for providing uh, electricity. But what else can it do? What other benefits does that uh, technology have? Yeah, so solar PV can also help with your hot water. Um, there are a number of devices out on the market that will divert extra PV. So um, say you're out at work during the day and um, your PV has maybe just got a small base load to cope with and there's, there's excess, um, it will divert that to the immersion heater on your hot water cylinder or to the, um, to the uh, immersion that's inside a sun amp um, to store, store hot water ready for when you get home from work and um, you want to take a shower. There's lots of different types of solar PV, aren't there, in terms of integrated tiles and things like that. Do you, do you, do you offer all of those? And, and what are the benefits of, of the different types of technologies? Yeah, so um, you can just integrate the solar PV into a roof, very much like a Velux window. Um, that kind of, that's how they end up looking, really. Or you can build an entire roof out of solar panels. So that's what we've done on our garage here. Um, it's just the whole roof is, is made out of, up of solar PV. Our audience are a bit geeky, I can say that because I am as well, and we're kind of fascinated by apps and technology integration. So I'm just wondering how solar PV, solar thermal, these things come together, and, and can they actually get more, more efficient and more easy to use? Yeah, I mean, I think the one app to rule them all is, is what, we're, <laughs> what we're all looking for, isn't it? So um, we work with customers who are installing heat pumps and solar PV and solar thermal and batteries. and um, we really do need those all to work together so that when, um, for example, if, if the weather forecast says that it's going to be a sunny day, you don't want your heat pump to start up early in the morning wasting electricity, heating your hot water up when your family don't bath or shower till the evening. So um, we, have, we are seeing an increasing number of, of apps coming along. My Energy is a really, really good one that will start to tie these things together so that we can control where the PV power goes, when the heat pump turns on, when the solar thermal um, is, is going to be sort of get m the most use out of it really. Because if you've already got a tank full of dead hot water at 
nine o'clock in the morning and then the sun comes out, solar thermal's not really got anywhere to, where to go. It needs to be kind of managed so that we make the best use of these kind of techs. One app to rule them all. I think it's, I, can, I can almost feel Robert getting quite excited <laughs> about the prospect of that. Well, thank you very much, Leah. It's been great to talk to you today. Brilliant. No However you're generating your power, it makes sense to consider storing that energy when it's cheap and self-consuming that stored energy when energy from the grid is more expensive. Tesla's Powerwall is the best known product in this space and Robert regularly shows off his, but there are a fair few electricity storage options for your home. Now we've covered home batteries many, many times on Fully Charged, so I probably don't have to sell you into that, but what if your battery is on your driveway? Today we're gonna to have a look at vehicle to grid. Does it really make sense yet? Back to basics then, how does vehicle to grid work? In its most simple terms, it's a car that can um, take energy from the battery and put it back on the grid. So it's a two way process. So all electric vehicles can take energy from the grid and charge up their battery to use. Vehicle to grid, a special kind of you know, system that will allow the car to put the energy back on the grid again. Can anyone get this? How do they go about it? So at the moment, we're still running it as a trial. And part of the trial is learning about how customers experience getting vehicle to grid. And part of that is us learning about what models work for customers, what services work for them. So at the moment, it's not available um, commercially. Um, what I can say though, is that uh, over the next sort of six to 12 months, we're gonna see more and more of these systems becoming available. And as we see other cars becoming available with a slightly different technology um, to Chadamo, a CCS um, type systems, then we'll start to see more options opening up to customers. So uh, yeah, there's a lot to come in the next 12 months on V2G. Why would you do this? You know, what's the benefit for us? Probably two main reasons. One is to help themselves and their family and their home. And one is to help the grid. So um, this allows uh, someone to um, make extra use of their car, ultimately. Um, if you've got an electric vehicle, that's great, but you can only use it to drive around. This kind of doubles up what you can do with your car, that you can choose what you do with the energy that's in the battery, and you can choose to use that to um, power your home and to, to support the grid as well. So from a personal perspective, it's reducing your bills and it's reducing your impact uh, on the grid because you're not drawing power when you're running your home ultimately um, from the car, but also to help the grid because um, as a lot of your viewers will know, we burn a lot of fossil fuels in the UK around tea time. So four and seven, there's a lot of demand. Everyone puts their kettles on, their cookers. And uh, at the moment, uh, we need to burn fossil fuels to meet that peak uh, demand. So. If, uh, if we have a vehicle to grid fleet out there of you know, thousands and thousands of vehicles in the future, we'll be able to significantly reduce that peak by, uh, by using the energy that's stored in those vehicles rather than burning fossil fuels. And a conventional car will spend 90% of its time on the driveway doing absolutely nothing, but this is an asset, isn't it, that you can, you can actually use. And how do you, can you schedule it? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You can, you can choose how to use the battery in the vehicle. Um, we've built a scheduling function into our app so that you can tell the system um, when you need the car and at what level of charge you need the car. But the other important thing to say is that you always have control. So the car is never locked away. It's never not accessible. You can always tell the system, actually change your plan, need to pop to the shop or you know, decided to go out. Um, I'd like the car back, please. And you can always have access to the vehicle. And we think that's super important because uh, ultimately it is still a car. It's still a way of getting around. So that's really, really important. Later in the series, we'll be visiting other homes around the country to talk about all the other technologies that you could consider. The humble boiler has been the dominant technology in heating in the UK for decades, but we think it's time for a change. Actually, a hot water tank becomes a really great opportunity to start storing low cost and low carbon energy. Post-combustion technologies and, and stopping burning stuff, so the edit hashtag stop burning stuff. We're here to talk to Kenza about ground source heat pumps. With a heat pump, we're putting one unit in, three units in from the ground, we're getting four out. So we're quartering the cost of heat. And you're going to get a very, very energy efficient heat pump system, which is just phenomenal. I'm really excited about this project. Zero emission boiler, we call it a ZEB, is basically, it's a plug and play replacement for a fossil fuel boiler. 
there. They're warming the thermal mass and radiating out, and because of that, you don't need to run them for as long. We realise that the key is smart technology. Huge change, and it works. And that's the bottom line. It takes low cost off-peak electricity, so you can keep the heat for days and actually weeks. In the next show, we're going to talk about the great untapped resource, hot water. From solar thermal to thermal storage, from aerated shower heads to smart hot water tanks. Until the next episode though, if you have been, thanks for watching.